Hello, and thank you for joining us on our live stream tonight. I'm David Cruz, Senior Correspondent for NJTV News. I want to say on behalf of all of us at NJTV News, thank all of you for joining us tonight and for your continued support of NJTV News. Our guest tonight is a graduate of St. Francis Nursing School here in Jersey City. She is a uh, she got her BS from uh, BS in nursing from Rutgers, a master's from Ryder, summa cum laude. Both, thank you very much. She is the former CEO of University Hospital in Newark, and and former CEO of CHE Trinity Health. She is the woman who needs no introduction, despite the fact that I've given her an introduction. Now she is the commissioner of the Department of Health, Judith Persichelli. Uh, Judith uh, Persichelli. Uh, Commissioner, thank you so much for doing this. We appreciate it. It's great to be here. Thank you. Are you aware that you have inspired a Twitter hashtag? I, yeah, I've heard rumors of that, <laughs> but I really haven't followed it. It's hashtag TWWNNI, which you might imagine stands for Need the no. woman who needs no introduction. <laughs> This can't be what you um, expected when you signed on uh, for this job, as, as you said to us earlier last August. I mean, do you remember what your priorities were then? It can't have been an international pandemic. Absolutely not international pandemic. When I first signed on, I thought this is the, the penultimate of a full career in healthcare and that I was going to have an opportunity to build a strategic foundation to help people in New Jersey live long, healthy lives and to uh, improve the programs that we have and to set a foundation for the next uh, decade, really, of uh, um, you know, Strategy New Jersey um, 2030 uh, uh, going forward. Yeah, it's different than what I expected. You were telling us earlier that this is uh, this came at a, a really difficult time in your life, this job. It really did. My husband had passed away in, in the end of July, and I had committed to the governor that I would uh, come on August 4th. And I had a choice to make, and I decided, this is the, let me do it. Um, and I'm glad I did. It, it, um, health is health care. Health is my life. Uh, and it just filled, it fills the days more than I expected at this point in time, but it's, um, it's, it's a privilege to serve, I can tell you that. We saw you yesterday at the White House. Was that your first visit to the Oval Office? Absolutely, yes. What, what, what was that like? Well, you know, it's the, just the whole uh, aspect of it. I mean, you know, we grow up in, in, in a wonderful country and we elect presidents, uh, and I, I go by what Governor Murphy says all the time. This is, you know, this is the president that we elected, and you know, you 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 have you're all you're in awe of all of that. And I was, and the Oval Office is smaller than I thought it would be. It looks so much bigger on TV, but it was quite an experience, and um, again, a privilege to, uh, to be there. Were Were you all tested? Before you went into the Oval Office? Uh, yes, we were. Yes, the, our first stop was the medical offices. We noticed, uh, I noticed, and, and people mentioned to me that there was not much social distancing going on there and nobody had on any gloves or masks. Was yeah. that a White House requirement? Uh, I think because everybody is that goes in there is tested and it's the, the diagnostic test that says whether you have it or not. Uh, so I think that that um, allows them to uh, break some of the rules that we have been enforcing in New Jersey for quite a long period of time. I, I can tell you that here in this office and whenever we're with the governor and any meetings we have, even though many of them are by video, we wear masks. Yeah. Most of our questions today are going to be from viewers. So we're, we're going to jump around a little bit. Those of you watching on our YouTube channel, you can still send questions via email at news at njtvnews.org, or you can follow the hashtag NJTV coronavirus. Uh, I'm going to start with a pet peeve of mine, uh, if you don't mind, Commissioner, but a lot of people have mentioned this to me. Uh, when all of this started, we were instructed to wash our hands frequently. A lot of us 
learned how to wash our hands for the first time in our lives, probably, uh, then it became clear that masks were an important part of, of fighting the spread of this virus. And masks are ubiquitous now. But I see a lot of first responders and a lot of medical staff wearing masks, but not wearing gloves. If you're not wearing gloves and masks, are you kind of going out there half dressed? It depends on what you're going out there for. Um, and, and if you're not going to wear gloves, uh, we uh, do recommend that you carry the antiseptic uh, hand wash and that uh, you make sure it has 60% alcohol and you use it frequently. So soap and water is still the best, 20 seconds. Uh, but if you're not gonna do that and then you're in the field, uh, make sure you always have, um, or you're always near a dispenser with an antiseptic. And of course, if you're going to be with patients that you either know have been tested positive for COVID-19 or could be under suspicion, you must wear gloves. We see a lot of these statistics at these daily briefings, number of people who have died, number of new infections, hospitalizations, et cetera. But so few people are getting tested around the states. Uh, doesn't it call into question the validity of, of these statistics? Well, the, the statistics are, you know, the numbers are the numbers. But I think what you're alluding to, which I agree with totally, is we have to ramp up testing for two reasons. One, to get a general idea of how prevalent uh, 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 COVID-19 uh, is in the, in the population. And the other is to detect active COVID-19 uh, individuals. And uh, you know the plans we have for testing, uh, right now we have over 80 testing sites you know, in uh, um, uh, New Jersey. And the plans we have for wide scale testing uh, for example, uh, Department of Corrections, uh, I think they came out today with their press release. We're testing all the employees and all of the forensic individuals. Uh, we'll be doing vulnerable populations. We're starting long-term care from south to north with plans to test as many individuals and staff as possible. Uh, many of our hospitals are uh, undertaking full testing of uh, their employees. Um, we have plans to test our seasonal farm workers. These are some, um, these are some populations that uh, people either don't know exist or don't realize that they are as vulnerable and need to be attended to. Um, we have plans for the seasonal farm workers uh, for 100% testing. Uh, we have plans for urban centers, people that can't drive to a drive-through center. We're gonna be dispensing uh, and deploying um, mobile vans uh, into neighborhoods. Uh, so we are going to double our testing and we hope to reach 700,000 tests, you know, over three, four months, five months, 700,000 uh, tests a month. It sounds like a lot, but in a state of not, in a state of 9 million people still is a, a drop in the bucket. That's right. That's exactly yeah. right. Uh, we saw that Jersey City is starting universal testing uh, for anyone who wants a test free of charge, uh, including those who are asymptomatic. Is that kind of the, the gold standard of what we want to see test-wise? Yeah, we definitely want to move to asymptomatic, and uh, we'll do that in stages. So we started with symptomatic individuals. Next is, and as early as next week, uh, we'll be announcing asymptomatic who have had an exposure to someone uh, that is uh, uh, COVID uh, positive, COVID-19 positive, and then do as much universal as we can. At some point, the, the technology of this is going to catch up with us. And as we've seen with um, you know, Ancestry.com, we'll do a lot of home testing. Uh, and the important thing to the Department of Health is to make sure that if somebody tests positive, they are appropriately quarantined or isolated and appropriately connected to care. That yeah. is our biggest goal. We got a lot of questions about those coming up. Uh, Swarna asks on YouTube, what's the current lag time in reporting test results? Uh, at this point, I think it's under five days, um, three to five days for uh, test results, which is much better than it was when we first started. 
when there were uh, just very few labs doing uh, the testing. That's the current standard. Is is there um, are there other tests? Like for instance, you got tested at the White House. They knew immediately whether you had the virus or had been exposed to the virus, or how, how did that work? I mean, well, in- it, was, it was immediate, and uh, right. it was a nasal swab. And we waited not even 10 minutes. Uh, it's the, the fast test, nasal swab. It's been approved by the FTA. And uh, I know a number of the um, uh, test uh, apparatus uh, have been deployed in New Jersey. We're testing them and we hope to get more of them. And I think we will see a lot more of them. It really is a question of expense, right? I mean, these tests are not cheap. It is definitely a question of expense and availability. Um, I keep reminding everyone, this is a novel virus. We have never seen this uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus, the disease is COVID-19, the virus, SARS-CoV-2. We've never seen this type of coronavirus before, but you do know that there's multiple coronaviruses. Uh, Coronaviruses, cause the common cold. Uh, So there's lots of them. But this one, we have never seen before in humans. So the availability of the reagents, the test kits, and uh, the availability of the machines to do the the fast point of care testing, um, ramping that up is uh, it's starting from, you know, the starting line, ground zero. And we're trying to you know, drive that car to, you know, 60 miles an hour in three seconds, and it's going to take a little bit longer. Suffice to say, though, that somewhere down the line, we, somebody dropped the ball. I'm not here to try and place blame on anyone in particular, but we should have been ahead of the curve on this back in February, no? Um, It depends on what curve you're talking about. Uh, I think that the uh, indication of what was going on in China was uh, uh, caused uh, uh, everyone to pause at that point in time. I know that here at the Department of Health, we put together a crisis management team on January 24th, January 24th. By February 2nd, Super Bowl Sunday, I might add, I got a phone call from the CDC that Newark Airport was going to be a funneled airport and that was when they were funneling people who had traveled through China right. uh, to specific airports. And we, were, we, were, we had to be prepared to screen 350 passengers on February 3rd. On February 3rd, the governor promulgated an executive order, called for a whole of government approach, the Corona Task Force. And we started meeting the Department of Health's team every day. And we have met every day since uh, uh, January 24th. And the Coronavirus Task Force uh, has met every week since February 3rd. Uh, did, did we jump on it soon enough? I'm just talking to the state, not on the national level. Um, I think in retrospect, you can always say, what if we had done a little bit sooner or a little bit of this? Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we felt we were as prepared as we could have been given the knowledge that we had at the time. Yeah, we should also note that we're a nation of 300 million people, uh, 50 states. New Jersey has 560 municipalities. So many different, um, so many different uh, part- uh, conflicting interests at play as well. So uh, that's certainly a reality. Uh, Chuck uh, asked via email and says, New Jersey has been locked down since March the 21st. The incubation period for the virus is 14 days. Why are there still 3,000 plus positive cases reported every day? And this week we saw 400 people die in, in one day. That's a great question. Uh, we can only suggest that the incubation period is 14 days. We have learned uh, that there are some people that are asymptomatic uh, and they are um, shedding virus and could be infecting people. We, uh, if they're not social distancing, staying home. We also know that uh, there's a lot of people with mild or moderate uh, disease. You're feeling a little punky at home. You're kind of like, oh, I feel like I'm getting the flu. Uh, they're all coming out as 
maybe that's the symptom. So they're coming out now to be tested and we're finding that they have active disease still. Uh, the, the efficiency of this virus, uh, how quickly it moves from people to people is what we're still trying to get control of. So was 14 days enough? Um, maybe not. Maybe we're finding that we're, we've been in what we call lockdown for a month. Maybe it has to be longer. Yeah. But we track it every day and we look at hospitalizations to look at the burden of the disease over time and how difficult it is for people. And we're finding that that curve is decreasing. Lots of people are excited about the antibody testing. Should they be, given the fact that it, it doesn't really indicate an immunity? Well, we don't know what it indicates. That's part of the problem. What it does indicate is that you were exposed to a coronavirus and more than likely um, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, what we don't know is how long that immunity lasts. So the sero that's, called a, that's the serology test. You know, it's a, a, a pinprick uh, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, of blood. Um, what that is, is showing us, if we use that for wide scale testing, is the burden of disease at a point in time. How many people may have been exposed and developed antibodies? It is not diagnostic. It doesn't say you have this disease right now and you can shed virus and infect somebody. The more tests, the better though, right? Absolutely. Yeah, Chris asked via email, the governor on Wednesday mentioned that only one variant of antibody test is highly accurate in detecting past uh, infections of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, do we know if Quest or LabCorp are currently using this version of the test? I don't know the answer to that, but I can certainly find it out um, and get it back to you uh, and find out that answer. I know that uh, there's um, a big rush to get serology testing out to the market and um, you know the quality control type of testing uh, needs uh, to go on uh, for every single one and uh, testing the validity and the specificity is so important. But I don't, I do not know the answer to that specific question. Warna on uh, YouTube asks, does the state have any information on the status of plasma therapy? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, one of the reasons to do the serology testing is to uh, determine if someone had been exposed to the uh, virus and is carrying antibodies and whether that plasma, uh, the plasma from that person, particularly a person who has definitely had uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, COVID, um, maybe recovered and left the hospital, then had built up the antibodies. So we know for sure they had the, the, the disease. We have antibodies and their plasma may be very valuable if extracted and donated and helped uh, another patient builds up the antibodies in the other patient, actually infuses those antibodies into a patient that is struggling. There's been some success with that. So that's the value of the serology test for sure. I wanna jump around to um, this issue that has seen a lot of tragedy, not only here, but really around the tri-state area in the country, long-term care and nursing home, uh, nursing homes, particularly as it pertains to seniors. Uh, Alex asked via email, what broke in the nursing homes uh, causing such a high number of human life? Why weren't extra precautions taken all um, at all nursing homes? Um, that's another great question. Um, I think we have to start with the residents of nursing homes because what we're finding is the vulnerability of uh, older individuals uh, really made them more susceptible to um, uh, uh, catching uh, COVID-19. So you may ask why. Well, as we age, our immune systems weaken. It, that's why we see that younger individuals have mild or moderate symptoms. Some of them don't get it at all. Uh, but as you age, your immune system weakens and you're so vulnerable to something as virulent as COVID-19. So that's the first thing that we've realized at this point in time, that age is a vulnerability to COVID-19. The second thing is the ability of nursing homes 
to not, and many of them do a wonderful job at infection prevention. Uh, but when you have a group in a nursing home that has, you know, slight respiratory symptoms, we're still at the tail end of the flu season. You're looking at them, not that they could possibly be COVID-19 patients. You're saying, oh, we've got a slight increase in temp uh, or maybe even no temp at all. Now, we, remember we told people, take your temperature, take it twice a day. If it's over 104, uh, call your physician. Remember again, as we get older, our temperature control mechanisms don't work as well. So somebody doesn't feel well, the resident doesn't feel well, and maybe you have five residents that don't feel well, but it, it's not an alarming situation. And yet COVID-19 had already invaded their bodies and was taking up residents in their lungs and it just took off. So what do you do with something like that? Well, first you get the patients to the hospitals and many of our uh, long-term care uh, facilities did that. Secondly, you cohort patients, you start testing, you start taking symptomatic patients, putting them all in one wing and on, uh, asymptomatic patients away from them. Some of the physical plants of the long-term care facilities did not allow real effective uh, cohorting. And then uh, the third thing is you need appropriate PPE so that your employees coming into the long-term care uh, facility are not only protected from the patients, but that the patients are protected from them. So what we found we have a vulnerable population where COVID-19 was taking uh, uh, residents in their bodies. And they were, it was also on the outside exposing employees and employees were carrying it into the, the facilities without appropriate protective equipment. And then- I, cool. I'm sorry, continue. Well, then as you know, the whole uh, lack of a stockpile of personal protective equipment which is a national tragedy and certainly one that hit uh, uh, the state of New Jersey uh, as well, uh, limited the amount of appropriate equipment for a period of time. Some have suggested that there was lax oversight. Is there some validity to that? Depends on what you mean by oversight. Um, I think uh, that um, it's very difficult, again, when you have a novel virus. Again, this was something we had never seen before. Uh, so the oversight of um, being able to get ahead of this virus um, became difficult nationally and in certain pockets, certainly in our state. I don't think we can hide behind that. I think we have to say that when, when we realized what was going on, we tried to do as much as we could. Claire on Facebook asks, home health aides are going from house to house and working with this very vulnerable population. Has that risk been assessed and are the home health aides given appropriate PPE and training to protect themselves and their patients? Well, actually, um, I've been in contact with a lot of uh, community health agencies and uh, they're very um, uh, dedicated to making sure that the home health aides have the appropriate equipment uh, before they go into a home and they're also using a lot of telemedicine uh, to check on um, uh, their homebound uh, residents. And they're really only going out for the most important um, uh, visits. Hoboken Councilwoman Tiffany Fisher sent us an email asking, uh, she says many of the more densely populated cities like Hoboken uh, have public and or subsidized housing. Within some of these, there are buildings dedicated specifically to seniors uh, these seniors share communal uh, common spaces, including elevators, and walk amongst and interact with the rest of uh, their community daily. What measures is the state currently taking and will be taking to protect this population? Um, that we, They would be considered part of our um, vulnerable population cohort, and uh, we have sent out guidance uh, to all congregate living um, that uh, to, to be um, attentive to keeping social distancing, to making sure that people are not eating together, hanging out together, whether it's, it's in a, a common dining room or a hallway, uh, to uh, screen uh, individuals for symptoms, again, 
uh, respiratory symptoms, coughs, sniffling even, uh, and uh, temperature, and to uh, make sure that uh, at, at a point in time that people that are symptomatic get tested. Rolling Eyeballs is, uh, asks on YouTube, um, what is the plan in terms of testing? Will it be virus testing or just antibody testing? When's that gonna happen? Uh, well, we're roll we've rolled out a lot of testing to date. You, you know, through the 80 plus testing centers, uh, that's been all of the, what we call the molecular PCR testing, diagnostic testing, symptomatic individuals, over 100,000 uh, have been tested uh, to date. Uh, today, I think I reported about a 41% uh, positivity rate. What that means is 41% of the people uh, that tested uh, do have uh, the uh, virus. And uh, our first uh, goal is to do uh, testing, diagnostic testing uh, for the virus, but we may be doing uh, surveillance testing for the, to look at the burden of disease by using the um, antigen antibody or the serology test. So um, we plan on both. That number of 40%, uh, Christine asks, uh, she's from Highland Park, she asked by email, uh, with a percentage of positivity of over 40%, which she says is a far cry from the WHO benchmark of 10%, New Jersey's uh, positive percent remains the highest in the nation. Can we really contemplate reopening responsibly when our understanding of asymptomatic cases is so insufficient? Uh, let's talk about what that 40% tells us. The 40% tells us for the uh, group of symptomatic, remember it's only symptomatic uh, individuals, 40% of them are testing positive. Uh, it also says that 60% aren't, uh, but the 40% are testing positive. What you wanna do is get the positivity rate down to 10% or lower. Yeah. So she's absolutely correct on that. Uh, WHO recommends that. So what does that mean? It means we're not doing enough testing. In order for it to come down to 10% or lower, we have to expand our testing to between 700 and 750,000 tests per month. And the hope is that when we do that, that the actual percent of positivity, all of those people out there that have not been exposed, have not had mild or moderate symptoms, uh, all of those people out there that followed social distancing, stayed home, have been very careful about what they've done, they, ha they haven't been infected. And that positivity rate will come down. Now, the question will be, well, if it comes down to 20%, is that enough? We honestly believe with the population we have in New Jersey, if we do enough testing, we'll get that positivity rate down to 10%. And we will use that at just one of the benchmarks for going forward. Testing is going to be important, but of course, contact tracing is a big part of this. This Barb asks on YouTube, uh, have you made any mention about starting to hire disease detectives? I assume that's uh, the same as a contact tracer. The rule of thumb is 100 per 100,000 population. So New Jersey will need about 9,000 contact tracers, which sounds like quite a lot to hire and train, et cetera. How's it going to work? That's a, that's a great question. Well, but let's look at the numbers first. Uh, we need uh, case investigators and we need contact tracers. Uh, the contact tracers can be anywhere between 20 per 100,000 up to as high as 81 per 100,000. So let's deal with the 80 per 100,000. We would need about 7,000 contact tracers. What that assumes is that we are doing uh, diagnostic testing on uh, almost everyone in uh, New Jersey, which we don't believe we have to do. Um, as I said, as, as, as we learn more about this and the testing modalities, that this may change. Right now, we have about 200 individuals throughout New Jersey who are doing contact tracing every single day, not only with the positive uh, COVID-19 reports that they're getting, but they're doing contact tracing for all of the other types of diseases that we do contact tracing for, uh, HIV, all the STDs. So we have about 200, some of them um, 
are, they're embedded in our local health departments. Our local health officers are key to boots on the ground. Uh, some of them are volunteers right now from Rutgers Public Health School, uh, people that have stepped forward and said, I think you need help, I'm here to help. Um, I'm part of your county, I wanna help. Uh, but we expect that we will need, you know, probably between, you know, four and 6,000 um, contact tracers, maybe a little bit lower depending on uh, the, the testing um, principles that we follow. And we heard this week that Bloomberg Philanthropies and uh, here in New Jersey, a group like uh, the Citizens Campaign, they're going to help to stand up this army. Is there going to be a centralized clearinghouse for these folks or is this going to be a municipality by municipality or county by county effort? Um, we're, well, our plan right now, um, and you may know that for us to handle COVID-19 hospitalizations, we separated the state into regions, uh, North, Central, and South. Uh, knowing um, the uh, cultural aspects of municipalities, and we have so many of them, uh, we want to go region to county and use our county and our local health officers. And we and Bloomberg is uh, their 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 uh, rec uh, their um, option is to help us with the training. We're developing training modules. Uh, this is uh, not a difficult thing to do. There's a set of questions that you ask. Some of it can be done, and most of it can be done over the phone. Uh, so we're going to go region to county to local municipality and uh, organized through the local health officers. What, what does it take to get someone ready? How long does it, does it take to train a contact tracer? Uh, not long at all, uh, not even a day maybe. Right, Eileen uh, asked by email, she's a uh, uh, lead nurse and a contact tracer already, an executive board member of the New Jersey State Schools Association. She says, why is there no school nurse at the Department of Education to oversee the reentry process for our schools? And are you willing to invest in school nurses to do contact tracing uh, throughout the state? Well, first of all, let me tell you that I know uh, in my career and my, my, I have friends that are school nurses and they're such a valuable uh, a group of individuals for what they do every day. So I just wanna thank them for that. And uh, I would take all the school nurses, put them in the county offices and have them help us with contact tracing. I can't answer the, um, an, uh, the question about uh, the Department of Education. I can certainly pose that question uh, to them. Uh, but I just know that school nurses, uh, particularly as we've been working through uh, this epidemic, that they, they are valuable um, associates uh, in what we call this fight. Colleen O'Day, who is our colleague over at uh, NJ Spotlight, is watching. She asks, "Is re in reporting long-term care deaths, you have uh, bounced back and forth between lab confirmed and now suspected. Are current long-term care facility deaths comparable to all deaths to calculate a percentage? Uh, well, let me talk about suspected. What we're really looking at now is probable. Um, as we've seen the progress of this disease, what we have found is that there are many individuals that perhaps were showing symptoms of COVID-19, but for whatever reasons, uh, did not go to a hospital, uh, maybe was a, a, a person in a vulnerable state and passed away, but was not tested. And when you looked at the case, you have to say that looks like a probable COVID-19. So to get somewhat of a clearer picture of the death rate uh, of individuals, we are now looking at uh, probables. Uh, so that's the difference between lab confirmed, lab confirmed, tested, positive test, probable, symptomatic, and more than likely uh, a, a case. So we have to look at both to get a, a clearer picture again of the extent of this disease in New Jersey. All right, we have about 10 minutes left with Health Commissioner Judith Persichelli. Uh, so we're gonna go to some rapid fire questions. Um, one word or, or short, a uh, few word answers on, on these if, if you would. Um, Dr. Fauci, uh, I guess this week, talked about um, the efficacy of a drug called remdesivir. 
he expressed a lot of optimism about it. Do you share that optimism? Yes. General questions from YouTube, here you go. Why don't you have charts, et cetera, when you give reports like the governor does? Um, no reason, uh, I can consider that. Where can I go to, uh, this is David asking from Twitter, where do I go to isolate if I get the coronavirus so I don't go home uh, and give it to uh, get family members sick? Um, first of all, I would tell you to call your local health officer and work with your local health, health officer. If you cannot go home because you're, uh, this is not a short answer, I apologize. All right. If you Speak cannot, this is important, be fast. <laughs> this is important. Um, if you cannot go home because you can't appropriately isolate, the local health officer, along with the Department of Health, will find you a place to go. It could be a hotel in Secaucus that we've stood up. It could be one of our field uh, stations. And that brings to mind the question of the homeless who are particularly vulnerable. What kind of initiatives are on the way for that? It's exactly the same answer. Yeah. We take care of them. We had, uh, when I went up to the Secaucus Hotel, we had a floor with healthcare workers that couldn't go home uh, for whatever reasons and wanted to crash or you know quarantine at the hotel. And then we had a floor with a number of homeless individuals. Cindy asked via email, will individuals with severe disabilities who can't tolerate wearing a face covering be allowed to be in public without them? That's always going to be a problem. I think uh, the most important thing we can do is make sure they get tested uh, and, uh, and that they're free uh, of disease. Remember, a face covering is to protect you from me. That's more of the protection. So if they test negative, we don't have to be concerned. We interviewed Senator Mike uh, Doherty this week, and um, he was pretty much on a rant against the administration and, and saying it was overreaching in this uh, social distancing and other uh, requirements, particularly as it pertains to executive orders. But he said that <clears throat> uh, your office and the governor's office had predicted 14,000 hospitalizations and he said the numbers around 3000 and uh, he says why were you so far off and should you apologize for scaring the let's say heck out of uh, New Jersey residents we predicted at the height uh, with the predictive modeling and that's that's the, it's a model uh, that we would have 13,000 uh, at the height um, April 14th 15th uh, we actually had over 8200 uh, individuals in our hospitals with COVID-19. I can tell you that every acute care hospital, uh, particularly in the northern part of the state, uh, was overrun. And uh, they had more critical patients outside of critical care. They turned their hospitals into total critical care units. And, and if we did not do social distancing, if we did not uh, do all of the things that we said uh, you should do, to uh, flatten that curve and spread out the disease over time, we would have had to make some very difficult decisions in our hospitals about who got care. And we didn't have to do that, but we still had 8,200 cases. And that was before the disease even reached the Southern part of the state. Speaking about the Southern part of the state, this is a part two from uh, Senator Doherty. He says that the fatality rate is less than 1%, particularly he, he points to Camden County, he says, shouldn't that be a number that you use to open the southern part of the state more widely? Um, by, I mean, economic activity. Yeah, um, you know, you look at a number of indicators. Um, deaths are a lagging indicator. In other words, it doesn't talk about uh, uh, instant disease at this point in time. Uh, people are in the hospital, some of them are in the hospital for 20, 30 days before they pass away. We look at it. What I do want to point out in the southern part of the state and of which Camden is part, the density of the population is so different from the north, but the uh, increase in the disease right now in the hospitalizations in the beginning of April, we had about 500 cases. I think it was 400 and something. We now have over 900 in our hospitals. So we've had almost a uh, you know 100% increase in the number of cases. It's just that the population is not as dense. So the disease is there. 
We're hoping that uh, the, um, uh, as we've learned to, to treat the disease, that the uh, uh, mortality is not as high, but uh, the increase in disease in the South uh, is astounding. That's the hottest part of the, of the state right now, no? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, David on YouTube, Arshiel on email, and Helen also on email ask pretty much the same question. Are elective surgeries still on hold? When can we see selective surgeries resume? Elective surgeries are dependent on a number of, number of indicators and we're watching them very carefully. Uh, you wanna see a 14 day decrease in the number of hospitalizations of uh, COVID-19 uh, individuals and persons under investigation. You wanna make sure you have the appropriate level of PPE uh, because you will still have COVID-19 patients in the hospitals and you're gonna have to cohort uh, the COVID-19 patients from patients that um, uh, do not have uh, the disease. Uh, you wanna make sure that your healthcare workers are, are uh, ready and able and healthy uh, to come uh, to work and take care of more cases of elective surgery. Uh, you wanna make sure that you may have a private entrance for people to come in uh, and that, they're, uh, that patients coming in are tested um, for uh, COVID-19. And you know, you really should do two tests, uh, you know, cut seven days apart to make sure that uh, you, you caught the person being negative uh, twice. And you wanna make sure you have a full surgical team uh, that again is disease free and healthy uh, to, to take care of your patients. So there's a lot of indicators. Uh, we're getting there. Uh, we're probably, we're closer now uh, because of the decrease in cases, but we still have, uh, you know, 6,000 cases uh, in the hospitals. So it's a lot. So can you give a time frame? a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month? Well, we will definitely look for the 14 day significant decline. Uh, and it may be that some communities open up before others. You talk about that 14 days, is, where are we? Ha have we counted those days yet? Uh, I count them every day. Uh, and, and actually uh, we have been flattening for the last 10 days and the last three days we've actually seen a decline. So it's flattening to a true decline. And we're looking at both. There's so right now we've seen, we've seen three days of decline, did you say? Yeah, about three days of what I would call, yeah, that's a decline, you know, yeah. it really jumped down. There's flattening and then there's decline. And in the central part of the state, we've just seen flatten. So we've seen decline uh, beginning in Northern, flattened central, uh, but in the South, uh, we've seen increase. So we may go community by community. You know, there's been these protests of, of, uh, across the country, folks who want to reopen economies in, in a variety of states. And a question that came up was, if a cashier can be protected enough to be at work, why can't a hairstylist? How can we make that interaction safer? I'd have to think I about that. I say that, that as a long-haired man as well. <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd have to think about that. I mean, these are all questions we ask ourselves. Yeah. When do you open up a beauty parlor? Certainly, I need it. <laughs> but when do you do that? And what is the appropriate protection? Does a flat face mask, a surgical mask, offer that protection? Uh, again, uh, we know that uh, you know there's a there's a percentage that it might not. And if somebody has symptoms, I don't care if you're a customer or a worker. If there's any symptoms whatsoever, you cannot be at work. You yeah. cannot be around people because the mask will not give you 100% protection. You would have to literally be in a bubble. Uh, almost, <laughs> almost. So uh, tomorrow, parks will be reopening. Uh, the governor has been saying data determines dates. Earlier this week, he said that there was no plan to open parks. And then two or three days later, uh, he issued another executive order that's going to reopen county and state parks. What data determined that date? I don't know if I can point to any specific data. I just know that this governor is so close to every number. He looks at them every day, questions me every day about them. What does this mean? How can we do this? What's the best? He, um, you know, I, to me, it's one of the most informed uh, governors about the science of what's going on. And, you know, he has to look at the general principles. And one of the things we discuss a lot about is the mental well-being 
of people who have now been indoors for a long period of time. We're seeing many more calls to our hotline. We're seeing the stress of individuals staying indoors. We're seeing the calls to our sexual abuse hotlines actually going down because kids are not outside. They're not, they're not with coaches and uh, teachers and school nurses who you know, look for signs of some distress. Uh, so at the end of the day, that more than anything, I believe, gave him the opening to say, let's try it for, for mental well-being, emotional well-being. Let's try it. Let's get people outside. And he has full trust in the new, that every New Jerseyan is going to follow the rules. All right. Last question. Who is in the room giving the most advice uh, to the governor, what three or four people are in there having the most influence on his decision making? Well, first and foremost, it's our epidemiologists. We have a strong array of epidemiologists that are uh, nationally known. Uh, Dr. Christina Tan is our state epidemiologist. Early on, uh, we gave a call to Dr. Eddie Bresnitz, former um, state epidemiologist, worked on vaccines at Merck, uh, again, nationally known. He's joined our team. We have Dr. Ed Lifshitz, um, Dr. Lisa McHugh, who is a PhD epidemiologist. She tracks this every day, and all of them give uh, great input uh, into uh, the, the governor and decision making. And then, you know, he looks to his team. Uh, he has much um, conversations with cabinet members, uh, ed whether it's education, uh, children and families, human services. Uh, he is most accessible in getting input about their particular uh, areas of uh, responsibility and uh, what they're looking at. And he synthesizes all of that and uh, comes out every day uh, prepared to respond to questions and uh, present in the most transparent way uh, what we're up against. All right, we've gone over time. We already held you over uh, our, our expected uh, 30 minutes. So I wanna thank you, uh, Commissioner. You know. It really does take an entire team to put this humble program together. So I want to thank our executive producer, Jamie Kraft. Our producer tonight is Lindsay Rassman. Our director is Elvin Badger. The producers who've been wrangling all of your questions all week include Julie Dorio, Laura Galarza, and Martha Ugu. Uh, special thanks to our graphics team for their work in promotions all week. And those of you who are watching on YouTube right now, hop over to the comments section and give a special big ups to your moderator, Tim Nostrand. Uh, I'm very happy to announce that next week, this program will air on Thursday live at 6.30 and our special guest will be Governor Phil Murphy. So, uh, Commissioner, thank you very much for taking the time. We appreciate it and we hope you'll come back and see us again. I will. Thank you so much for having me on. Excellent. Those of you watching at home now, thank you for tuning in tonight. And to all of you for your support of NJTV News uh, throughout this very difficult time for public television in general. I'm David Cruz. For all of us here at NJTV News, thanks for watching, and we will see you next Thursday.